Well, it's finally here. The video I know everyone wanted me to do since episode 1 of Pikmin clones happened. Ever since I did the April Fools video and reviewed Hey Pikmin instead. And I've teased and made jokes about finally doing this one day, but that day is now here. I'm finally going to be reviewing Pikmin 1. I asked my community what the next video topic should be on, and you all have spoken. So without further ado, it's Pikmin 1 time. For starters, what version of Pikmin 1 will I be doing today? I'm sure all of you are aware that Pikmin originated on the GameCube and then had later ports on the Wii with motion controls. Then the most recent port for Pikmin 1 coming out being for the Nintendo Switch. Now out of all three of these ports, I would argue that each have their pros and cons. GameCube being the fact it's the oldest version and not looking the best. The Wii version having to have you get used to motion controls and there's no way to turn those off. And then the Switch version while having a nice aspect ratio bump making this version look way more modern than the other two just with worse looking colors, which makes the older versions look way more natural. Plus a lot of the old product placements are gone, which is weird to hate since most product placements are annoying or very off-putting, but I feel these were a strong part of the original game. The better textures make things look way more realistic, it's just the colors don't accompany that look. I however decided to pick the Wii version even though I owned the game on GameCube. It's just way easier for me to capture gameplay footage with my Wii U because of HDMI. I also didn't want to pay around $50 for basically a better looking GameCube version, so that's why I didn't go with the Switch port. And I get it, I can get both games, but I also can get both games on my Wii U for way cheaper. If you know what I mean. That's not to say the Switch version is a bad port, as you have options to use gyro aiming and that seems to work fine for what it is. I just would much rather stick with my old fashioned Wiimote. I did however dread playing this with motion controls, but I was informed by many people that this actually was the best way to play this game. So I trusted them and I can say that I was very surprised how much I fell in love with Pikmin 1. I think out of anyone I probably have the weirdest view of coming into this franchise that no one else would have. I've played many of the clone games of Pikmin and experienced how easy it is to mess up the Pikmin formula or how much the design philosophy can be expanded on. Plus my only actual Pikmin experience being Hey Pikmin, it's safe to say I don't think anyone has ever come into the series the way I have. I also have plans for more clone videos so don't worry guys I've just been busy with other projects but I do actually have one hopefully coming out after this video so stay tuned for that. But because of this, I feel I can offer quite a unique look into the series. But for those that aren't aware what Pikmin is, I think it's time to do a little history lesson. The idea of Pikmin comes from two devs, Chige Fumihino and Masamichi Abe. They had this idea to move multiple characters on a single screen around an environment. Hino wanted to take these characters and make them do stuff like how you would control the Sims. This would take place with you giving them commands to then watch them do things in the world. He called this controlling them with thought chips. From what it seemed like according to the interview on Nintendo World Report, they were going to do more actions accustomed to traditional RPGs like attacking, defending, healing, etc. They also would have been able to equip more of these thought chips as the game went on, but no one really knows what this would have been like. There was even another idea talked about when the game originally was using the codename Adam and Eve, where you would still play a godlike role but be able to make the characters breathe. Which makes sense when you see the first designs of the Pikmin as they even have genders. The gender corresponds with the color circle on the back. Apparently this was giving the devs a lot of trouble properly fleshing out so this idea was scrapped entirely. The only thing that seemed to carry over from the older ideas that they had was the bulb orbs, but if they looked the same I couldn't figure that out. But it was mentioned they served a role as a mammoth like creature. I personally don't like these and I'm glad we got the more cute designs of Pikmin. Miyamoto did state though that his design goal for the creatures was to make something high school girls would find adorable. Luckily thanks to Junji Mori we actually got probably the most impressive concept designs I've ever seen. He was inspired by the works of Tim Burton and came up with these, saying he wanted to have them look cute but also make the onlooker feel a little unnerved by them. With each Pikmin even having different flowers on top of their heads, 
it makes me wish something like this was in the final game. Following these designs, apparently a lot of the team watched weird artsy movies that were hard to find. One of them being the movie Fantastic Planet. I really feel this paid off because of how drastically different Pikmin feels even compared to a lot of the experimental games being released on GameCube. Now another big thing I always hear about is how Pikmin seemed to get its inspiration from an interesting demo showed off for the GameCube. And that demo being Mario 128. You see it's pretty believed that Mario 128 is the inspiration behind Pikmin 1. Most people seem to think the demo was repurposed and gave the devs the idea about controlling multiple characters on screen and seeing this was their eureka moment for how they wanted the game to work. This actually isn't the case. Turns out this was a lie belief for almost two decades. I even remember seeing it on early Did You Know Gaming videos and I mean looking back on it, I can see why everyone thought this. Like it just makes perfect sense. Why wouldn't this unreleased tech demo that looks very similar to a game actually released not be what gave the devs the idea for said game? So I mean it makes sense why people would believe this interview, but this is the only interview I could find that even states any of this. Thanks to Nintendo World Report again even helping me go down this rabbit hole about debunking it, I learned that Yuji Kondo, the programmer behind the game, was interviewed about it and said that he and the team didn't even know what Mario 128 even was, meaning the demo didn't have any influence on the planning stages or the mechanics. They apparently had the ideas already made for the team to work off of, and the Mario 128 demo was made by another group entirely. However, Miyamoto was apparently the only person anyone can say was involved with the demo of Mario 128, while being a part of the development of Pikmin 1. But since you or I aren't part of the dev team, no one can for sure say if Miyamoto used it as an inspiration, but since the dev team apparently didn't even know about it, it's more likely it never had a big involvement for Pikmin 1, as many people think it did. I did also do my own research trying to find where they got their claims from on Nintendo World Report, as I didn't want to just believe them and not do my own research, you know. What, what do you think I am? I reviewed Planet Da. I'm all about trying to do research sometimes getting it wrong, but that's besides the point. I did find an interview with Miyamoto where he stated in this that the main idea for Pikmin came from trying to find a way to reorganize something they were already working on and mentioned, what if they were ants? Miyamoto felt ants were the most relatable to base the game's ideas off of as everyone has experienced ants in their life. Also, ants are known to be weak by themselves, but their strength comes in numbers, being able to take down foes 10 times bigger than them. Before they came up with the idea of ants, a lot of people had different suggestions, but all of them lacked clear goals. The biggest reason why ants were picked is because at the end of the day, they always find their way back home, as that's the goal. If we're not counting ant mills, as that's a whole other issue with ants. Um, look it up if you want to see ants basically commit suicide, it's pretty crazy. Which I would say returning home is a big theme for Pikmin 1, since you spend the whole game trying to make sure Olimar gets his ship parts and makes it back. So I would argue that as far as I could find, the Mario 128 being what inspired the idea for how Pikmin would be is a lie. I will say that I do think they did use the AI for the Marios to help make their idea they already had for Pikmin come to fruition, but I still say even that idea is just me believing what I feel could be true. It's just again hard to say this is true when the only thing that pushes this narrative is the one interview that I found and nothing else. Again, going back to the interview with Miyamoto, everything he basically brings up for what helped the idea come together was even before he settled on the final designs for the Pikmin. Miyamoto says after seeing the concepts we talked about before, these weird alien creatures with flowers on their head used to consume water by lowering it into the liquid. He knew the characters were a perfect fit for the game when he had the camera zoom in on them to see their blank expressions looking back, even describing that it gave him quite the chill. Apparently, the chill came from the fact that he wanted to see something happen to these innocent creatures. It's crazy to see how much Miyamoto wanted this game to end up showing the moral compass of the player, as he believes no one is completely neutral and this game would easily unlock how the player would care or even disregard the life of these creatures, either showing support and trying to keep each one alive, or just letting the pig fall to the slaughter. These thoughts were so strong during the development that even the devs in him were asking while watching Pikmin die in horrible ways, is it okay to make something like this? So again, to wrap this part up, I think it's crazy how long this rumor was believed to be true and the rabbit hole it led me down on the actual origins for Pikmin 1. As I was ready to just write, it came from Mario 128, tip tip tally ho. But after wanting to even clarify if this fact was true, I felt this whole segment came out for the better 
because of the fact that I learned more about the game than just saying it came from this demo. Speaking of demos, it's time to talk about the Pikmin 1 E3 demo that was showcased for the public. Apparently Miyamoto at the time made it seem like the game was finished, but turns out that all they had done was everything shown in this showcase here. Miyamoto, however, was so confident that they could get the game out and have it ready to be released around the launch of the GameCube, and they actually did. It came out the same year as the Nintendo GameCube. Also looking back at these trailers and showcases, a lot of the stages we see here were areas not in the final game while also having some mechanics that were changed in the final release, like the ability to have more than 100 Pikmin at a time, Pikmin also that were idling would become white as ghost, and you could even pluck them with your whistle. Overall, some other trailers did come out, but those were pretty close to the final release of the game, just with some minor stuff being different. Speaking of the unused stuff, I originally was going to leave it at that about the maps till I learned that these are viewable in the game with a ton of other stuff. So let's look into some unused content for Pikmin. For starters, Pikmin is one of the only GameCube games I know of that will run on PC if you put the disc into your computer. Granted, it won't run flawlessly, but by doing this, you get access to the debug mode for the game. It's mostly used here to see things the devs would need to observe to make sure everything is playing as it should. I originally was going to use footage from another channel to show this off, which you may ask, why would I need someone else's footage if I own Pikmin 1 physically for the GameCube? Well, it's because we live in a time period now where I'm more likely to own a 20-year-old GameCube game instead of owning a disk drive on my computer. But the only footage I could find wasn't the best quality, and it didn't go into depth on everything I would like, so I caved. I decided that I would go buy an external disk drive, so I drove to Walmart, and then they had a mariachi band here for some reason. I then found out the disk drives are expensive. I bought it anyways, just to come back home and realize it wouldn't even read the disk. Apparently this is a problem with modern PCs and the disk drive, I guess. Since I was told if this was done on an older computer that it would read the disk. And I even saw comments from old ass forums from like 2007 that said all they did was put it into their PC and it worked. Making the whole trip to Walmart completely worthless. Luckily, there is a way around it where I could get it to run, but it's one of the most convoluted things I've seen. First off, because we live in modern times, I could have skipped the whole thing of getting a disk drive by legally getting an ISO dump of the game and extracting the files from Dolphin. I can't tell you how to get this ISO, but there's probably many channels that will. I fortunately was lucky to find this cat who traded his eye and arm to Miyamoto for the ISO file. I promised this cat that the trade would have been worth it, so let's not let this trade go in vain. Once this was done, I would have everything. But even with the files now, they still won't run because the PC is too modern. So now what you have to do is find this file on the internet and make sure it's a specific version while also not downloading one as full of viruses, as these apparently are usually just infested with viruses. This will trick the system boot file to think it's on XP from what I've read. Then you have to make two shortcuts of the system boot file and make sure each shortcut has one of these lines of text in the path directory. After this is done, you have to open them in a specific order or it won't work. And after all that, you can now play a very buggy mess that's only for testing, but it's cool and I like it. So what does this test version have that makes it interesting? It has a bunch of test levels from the E3 demo and even some stages that are similar to the main ones in the game, but have some layout changes or enemies that aren't normally there. My favorite being this level that has a few of the bosses running around while even having an unused enemy here that's fully animated. I don't like how this looks because it looks like an asshole pooping and I see why it probably went unused. There's even a bunch of different dev options in the menu from viewing all the logs in the game, seeing sprites and how they blink, plus some that do nothing and crash the game. Many, many times will it crash. You will also notice in game how there's a lot of numbers and other scary looking tech stuff going on. Well, that's just some things that the devs would have used to make sure everything was working properly. I'm however not a dev, so I couldn't tell you what most of this stuff is, but it's neat. I think my favorite addition to this is the fact you can make all Mar jump. And when I say jump, I mean jump. This seems it was for getting around the area faster or at least getting yourself unstuck as this never made it to the final game. 
I think it's really interesting to jump so high to see the out of bounds areas as the skyboxes are usually just real life pictures the devs took of nature areas. There's even a model viewer but I for the life of me couldn't get this to work. If you do get it to work it's pretty cool to see in any animations for the models that play they will all play at 60 fps instead of 30 fps. The final thing I want to mention in this mini that allows you to change all the settings for the game from how fast and slow Olimar can move to even making him an absolute unit. The only issue is all of this is in Japanese and my PC which normally can see Japanese characters for some reason can't now so all the text shows up as gibberish English letters meaning I couldn't even translate it with Google even if I wanted to. But yeah that's the unofficial slash official PC port of Pikmin leaving us with only a few small things to cover like the fact these two appear in the game's codes. Mario being the more interesting one people usually see this and again assume it's because of Mario 128 but this model is way too detailed to be the same one used in the tech demo. This is more likely here to test something else entirely, or it's just a placeholder. What's unique though about this Mario is the fact his hair and mustache are the same color when normally this isn't the case. It's why he probably looks cursed and off to you if you're wondering. The other thing to talk about is the Goomba Man here. I'm sure those who know a lot about Sunshine are pretty familiar with him as he can be seen in the final game under one of the stages. So it's a little weird that he's here but it also means now we even have an earlier timestamp of this guy being in a GameCube game. Now if you ask me I feel this is just something a dev made and left inside the game files not really having any purpose besides being here. If anything I want to say maybe this Goomba became a joke among the devs but that's me wishfully thinking for an answer. Lastly, I want to mention how there apparently was going to be a moon timer for traversing at night in the game. This can actually be enabled with cheats and in the PC version it even mentions about a nighttime timer a lot in the settings. I'm not sure what would have been changed for the nighttime stages, but I would like to believe it would have been a way to allow players to try to make up for a bad day by going out at night. With the risk being enemies will be more aggressive or even tougher new enemies normally not out will show up. I really wish this would have been kept in the game. The only other unused stuff I can talk about are just things that either showed off in the PC version and didn't go into too much detail on, or they're just not as interesting. So I recommend going and checking out the cutting room floor if you want to learn more about this stuff. But what if I told you, we still weren't done with the interesting stuff I found that isn't the game itself. Pikmin actually got its very own manga. This manga is supposed to show the life of the Pikmin before Olimar crash landed, basically consists of them getting eaten and killed. Even has a scene where a Pikmin questions why he was ever born into this world just to then be mauled to death. It's again why if you ever feel bad about having any of your Pikmin die, just remember they were worse off before you showed up. There's even a video that does a pretty good job at animating the manga if you're interested in that. A lot of people in the comments though seem to not realize it's based off the manga but hey now you know. Overall I think that's everything I wanted to cover for the history and start of Pikmin. So it's finally time to get into the actual game. How will Pikmin hold up to my experiences of only being Pikmin clones and hey Pikmin? Will I love Pikmin and see what all the fuss is about or will I just not care? I don't know but I'm excited to find out. Pikmin begins with our pro tag who is one of the few Nintendo characters who has had intercourse before as he's heading back to his home planet to see his wife and kids. But while on the way back, he gets hit by a meteor knocking his ship off course as it goes crashing down to a planet below. Wait a minute. Planet? Planet? Planet D? Planet Do? You know what I just realized? This reminds me of another game that has our protag in space who basically has his ship crashed, known as Planet Dob. Planet Dob follows our protag named Dob or what turns out to be you pretending to be Dob as you go through the areas finding what are known as bits. These bits are then used in the DTMS to make it get all trippy, which then allows you to head off to the next area. But to find these bits it usually requires you to bring an item to a person which then in return gives you the ability to make a sound that will cause the bits to come to you. These bits can be pretty easy to spot but can also be quite hidden. Usually with the hidden ones it will require you to play a sound and do this weird time based minigame and thanks to the input delay on modern monitors this can make these quite annoying. But you can keep retrying them so it's not the biggest loss. Personally I adore how the bits are these little cubes that run around. They're like the 90s versions of minions but you don't see moms making posts about them on Facebook or the equivalent to the time. The bulletin board system. I even think a lot of the characters have such a unique charm to them. Kanichi did such an amazing job bringing them to life and I just can't get- Oh shit, this is a Pikmin review. She planted on my dob, 
until I think about how it feels. We now cut to a shot over the planet as pieces of the ship fall to the ground below. Olimar now wakes up to realize his ship in Only Way Back Home is now destroyed. Making things even worse is the fact the planet's atmosphere has high levels of poisonous oxygen, giving Olimar 30 days to fix the ship. Or, you know, die. <laughs> that That's the other option. It's not great. Then we're just sent on our way to explore the area we're in. We soon come across what seems to be a red ship with a flower on top as it springs out of the ground. Then a red seed pops out and floats down as it sprouts. Olimar makes a comment about how the ship looks similar to a vegetable from his home planet known as an onion. So he calls these giant ships an onion. After a little bit of waiting, we see the red seed form a leaf on top of it as it points up to the sky allowing us to pluck it out of the ground. This is when we're introduced to Olimar's only way off the planet which are the Pikmin. Olimar calls them Pikmin because they're similar to a carrot brand from his home planet called Pik Pik. Real quick, I just love how Olimar gives these little text stumps showing that he basically is reporting his findings and it's neat to see his scientific background come into play. And then I realize he's not a scientist, the man is basically a space mailman, so I don't know why I thought he was part of some scientific corporation. I mean, I was told apparently too that train conductors write about wildlife they see, so maybe he's more like a space train conductor. But I don't know, I thought he was a scientist this whole time. It really shows you my knowledge of Pikmin before coming into this. Anyways, we're now able to command the Pikmin to do our bidding, so we have it attack the flowers next to us. This then drops these bottle cap things with numbers on them. Using your Pikmin to bring these to the onion makes it shoot out more Pikmin. Apparently these onions are like incubators and when brought food converts it into more Pikmin for you to use. With not much to do in this area, we search around finding whatever pellets we can. Slowly over time, we build our numbers up to take on the first roadblock, a giant cardboard box. So this is going to be something you'll do pretty common in the game and that's using your pikmin to move things out of the way each thing that you'll move out of the way usually will require a set number of pikmin to use so better get used to micromanaging numbers of your units if you want to get anywhere once that's moved out of the way we even locate our first ship part after it's brought back we get this scene of the pikmin and all of are getting into the ship and flying off with each passing day, Olimar talks about his experience for the day and gives more comments about the ship while learning about Pikmin. We even have Olimar name the force below, calling it the Forest of Hope, as he knows it's what holds the key to his survival. Before we continue on, I do want to say that this isn't my first time playing Pikmin 1. As I did try playing the GameCube version a long time ago, and my experience was very short. I played probably the first day in the game and said, this is too stressful, I hate it. The whole clock ticking down while you're timed to get all the MacGuffins you need so Olimar doesn't die, I think that just stressed me out way too much. Especially with the idea that if I failed, I basically had to replay everything. I don't think I was able to vibe with that at the time, which looking back on it, it's weird that I adored Majora's Mask for its clock-based system and how it promotes a speedrunning mindset, as the more custom you get with the game, the faster and smarter you become with routing the different events that take place. To the point you go from, we got six more hours boys, let's go! to being able to do multiple tasks at once while still focusing on the main objective. So you would think that being Pikmin 1 strong suit, I would love it. But as much as I adored Majora's Mask, I didn't enjoy it because of the time mechanic. I actually learned how to beat the game in a way no one probably did, which was messing around in my friend's copy that he already 100%ed. So I never was stressed about doing anything as it was already done for me, so I was able to just take it slow and learn the game. Because of this, I was actually finally able to beat it for the first time. So going into Pikmin with me having no experience or what to expect, you can see why I just turned the game off, as even playing a already beaten copy of Pikmin wouldn't have helped me learn the game the same way I did with Majora's Mask. I personally just hated being timed when I was younger, as I felt it ruined the experience, but as an adult, I love how games implement time into them. It's actually my favorite way to play Sonic Heroes as Team Sonic, as the secondary missions are timed because of this timer, it makes the player use what they've learned from the game's mechanics and hone your skills to beat the stage as fast as possible. Like, have you ever tried to play a Katamari stage without the clock ticking away? It's pretty boring, as there's now no incentive to rush and have all this adrenaline to build the biggest Katamari possible, because whether I take 10 minutes or even 2 hours, I'll get the same result. But, now add a 5 minute timer and tell me to build it to this size, it's now a whole different experience. So just to get this out of the way, I think Pikmin does an amazing job implementing the time mechanic into the game and makes the player actually care, giving me very similar Majora's Mask vibes as both games endings if time runs out, 
is death. Especially add that with the biggest mechanic in the game being the Pikmin, you realize how beautifully implemented the time in the game really is. As it's no surprise how replaceable the Pikmin are, as it's quite easy to just send a group of them to their death and move on like nothing. I'm also sure a player wouldn't even think twice about a few Pikmin that died from the early stages in the game. I mean, even for me, I thought it was funny when a punch died due to my stupid actions. However, as days went by, I started to realize how much of an impact these seemingly forgettable moments had on my progress. Because of the time being here, I started to change my thoughts on the Pikmin, as now the value of one Pikmin, let alone 10 or 50, was way more crucial than ever. The more mistakes I made, the more units I lost, which in return meant I wasted more time rebuilding my numbers back up. The weight of my actions would be realized when I would try to move something to progress just to see I didn't have enough Pikmin at the moment because of dumb mistakes prior, then having me frantically hurry to recover the numbers back up before the sun set, which sometimes meant wasting a whole day in an area to stockpile as much as I could. The time mechanic really helps the player get attached to keeping the numbers up for your units, especially the closer it gets to the 30 day mark. Now that's not to say I didn't still make dumb choices the closer we got to the end because trust me, I did, but it at least helps me try to think more rationally on what is worth doing. The time mechanic also rewards players skills at multitasking. Players who are able to see multiple tasks and plan around doing them at the same time will progress faster than players who get tunnel vision and focus on one thing at a time. Which if you watched anyone play Majora's Mask for the first time, you realize how bad that tunnel vision can be. He said the third night. I don't want to miss it. I really, really love the ability to let Pikmin loose on carrying stuff back while I have another group help me either fight enemies in the stage or move an obstacle. It just feels so rewarding as you and your Pikmin are in sync and constantly growing the numbers while locating the ship part. To me, this was one of the bigger downgrades in Hey Pikmin as most of the time you weren't able to do multiple tasks at once and the game ended up feeling very one track because of that. Especially since Hey Pikmin is basically a weird 2D version of Pikmin 1 in a sense. Thankfully, finding the ship parts isn't hard as your map will show the location of them. The challenge comes from getting to the ship parts and bringing them back. Thankfully, if at any point you have to drop the ship part off somewhere and rush back to leave, the game will remember the spot it was left at, making it still feel like progress was made even if you didn't acquire the part just yet. The next day we head back down and start to grow our numbers more, we even discover the Pikmin will look for yellow substances in the grass called nectar. This nectar is usually used to strengthen them faster, as the top of their head will indicate how strong a Pikmin is, going from a leaf to a full bloom flower. Flower Pikmin can carry stuff way faster and overall just have their momentum in general increased. Personally though, I had them die usually before reaching this stage, but hey, it's there if you can keep them alive I guess. While here, we finally run into our first enemy encounter, the Bulborbs, which I love these designs so much. The smaller ones are quite easy to take out, but the bigger sizes are when you as a player need to actually plan how you want to attack, as throwing Pikmin from the front will just result in them being eaten faster, while if you hit them from the back, could have worded that better, you make it harder for him to eat your units. Which is another thing I love about a lot of the enemies you encounter. You get to learn their patterns and weaknesses, making players who plan and think before attacking better off in the long run. But that's not to say you can't just win by flinging units and hoping for the best, it's just again not the optimal strat you should do. I also think this is now a good time to mention the motion controls. While these aren't perfect and I can't give my opinion on the GameCube or Switch controls, I can say these feel very fluid and nice to use. Being able to aim quite fast at your target and throwing them feels so good. I also feel more precise with what I want to hit because of the controls I have with aiming. But an issue that can happen is the fact you have to press A on the Wiimote to throw, meaning if you have a heavy finger, you can easily move the Wiimote around, causing your aim to be off or needing you to recalculate the Wiimote's position while throwing. I would be aiming and then press the button rapidly to throw and slowly my cursor would start to drift off the target, usually going in front of them which would cause my Pikmin to get eaten. I also don't really like the pluck button as it's the same button for throwing Pikmin. It didn't happen much, but there were times where I would go to pluck a Pikmin out of the ground just to chunk the Pikmin off the ledge. That being said, I still think these are amazing controls and feel quite nice for Wii Motion. It's just they're not perfect. We now get introduced to the newest type of Pikmin and it's the yellow Pikmin. 
These guys are my favorite as they always look like they're in pain. They also can be thrown further and survive electricity. If you add that with the fact your throw is also increased while running, they can go quite far. Which, cool fact, this mechanic is also even carried to Pikmin Bloom for those who play that. So, there you go. I meant to Pikmin Bloom, so now we can all just die happy. They also are able to pick up bomb rocks unlike in Hey Pikmin where they change that to have Red Pikmin be able to hold them. The bomb rocks at first may seem like just an end all solution for any walls that may be in your way as that is mostly what they're used for, but they become quite useful for dealing with tougher enemies. I ended up trying my best to grab these whenever I could as they pack a punch for a lot of the later monsters you encounter making it usually safer to approach after hitting them with a couple of bomb rocks. Overall I found the yellows to be a little more useful than the Red Pikmin but i'm gonna tell you right now once you get to the later sections of the game they kind of start falling flat as the sun sets and we bring back some parts to our ship ali Amar mentions how his clock is showing the day coming to an end and it's time to head back as soon as possible while explaining more about the day mechanic now maybe i'm dumb and i did see some other people say the same thing but for whatever reason i went through this whole game thinking if you didn't bring the pikmin back to the perimeter around the ship that they just would get left behind even though the text here states, as long as they're in the group, they would be fine. So what this usually meant was I booked it back to the ship whenever it was getting closer to the sun setting when you never need to do this. Now Pikmin holding stuff or carrying things back will die as far as I could tell, as they're not considered as part of the group anymore. So just make sure you get them back before, you know, the time goes to zero. But yeah, as long as they're with Olimar, they're fine. I did still think they had to be put back into the ship directly, so call it another CQ having Texas education, but I just feel this could have been worded better. Especially since there were times the AI for the Pikmin wasn't the best, so it made the rush back more stressful when they would occasionally get stuck on stuff. However, I didn't have this issue nearly as much as I thought I would. Now looking at Pikmin from an outside perspective, the gameplay loop must seem quite simplistic. Pikmin is able to avoid this becoming too repetitive because of how many things need to be micromanaged and how much it encourages the player to adapt and learn on the fly, as that's what's going to separate the men from the da players. For instance, there's cases where enemies can spawn that normally don't. This guy here will drop a lot of nectar which will then power up your Pikmin. It's things like this that will make the player change up their game plan right then and there as now you're working with more powerful Pikmin because of something that was basically random. I also never felt the days dragged on for too long because of how much stuff I was trying to do at once. It made time fly by pretty fast. The stages also helped this at least for most of the levels as they don't always have a set way you need to retrieve the parts, giving the player a different path to evaluate on what would be riskier or faster with the safer pass usually taking longer over the ones filled with more enemies or hazards. I would say the only real issue with this is more when it comes to taking the parts back, as the AI for the Pikmin are programmed to take the road less traveled, even if that means they will carry said part down the road with high enemy traffic. I do wish there was a better way at directing them on which way they should go, but what this more just comes down to is occasionally it will be a better idea to stay with them while they walk back instead of going off on your own. Thankfully, the game does something to sort of remedy this. I enjoy that later levels will have shortcuts for you and the Pikmin to use to get back to the ship faster. The only drawback is the player using a day or two to make them. While wasting a few days to knock down the walls and clear a path seems counterproductive to a game about managing time to be as fast as possible, in the long run, it will save more time for the Pikmin, especially as some of these ship parts are way out of the way. It can also help change the path the Pikmin would have taken as now you may have made a faster path back that isn't surrounded by enemies. Speaking of enemies, there's an issue I've seen in a lot of Nintendo games and that's making random enemy fights feel like they have a purpose. I can't tell you how many times I would just avoid fights in Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask unless I needed to fight them. That's not to say the combat in these games are bad, it's just there's a certain point some players will reach where they start to think what the point of fighting these things even are. Do I really need to fight these enemies that are just more intended to halt progress without actually being able to stop me from walking past them? The obvious answer is no, unless you're playing Pikmin. I never had that feeling once. If I picked to not fight something, it was never because of me feeling it was pointless, as it was more about if the Pikmin I had at the time or if the situation I was in was worth risking the chance of losing more Pikmin than I would have gained from taking the thing head on. Which goes back to the risk versus reward. The risk with fights is there's always a chance you can go at it so poorly that you'll lose more units than what it would have given back to you. But if you fight it and kill it flawlessly, it now means your reward is your numbers have gone up. Meaning more options to what you can do on the stage. 
Since the pigment strike isn't from the individual, but from the colony, it is very entertaining to just watch whatever is in your path get flanked by your army of Pikmin. Plus, watching them carry it back to then have it be consumed into more Pikmin is never not satisfying. There's even a move you can do where all of your Pikmin attack a target at once called Swarm. I didn't know this was in the game because I had no idea how to do it for the longest time and I didn't remember the game ever explaining it. But yeah, it's an attack that emphasizes how much stronger you are when your numbers are high. Speaking of things the game has a bad time explaining to you, there's a lot of random mechanics that the game will never inform you about. That's not to say the game doesn't make some of these mechanics obvious, it's just only going to be obvious if you really observe what's happening. For the longest time, I didn't understand why my Pikmin weren't taking the yellow pellets to the yellow onion. Well, it's because the AI will prioritize where it takes pellets based on the numbers of a Pikmin type holding it. So if it has three reds and two yellows, it will go to the red onion and give you red Pikmin. I just didn't know this for a good while, and I also didn't know that the color of the pellet also matters. If you have a red pellet being carried to the red onion, it will give you more Pikmin because of that. This, as useful as it is, can sometimes make it really annoying as I need more of this specific color, but the only pellets around are huge numbers of the color that I need, and the only ones that I have that can carry these huge numbers are the opposite color. This can make rebuilding your numbers at times very tedious and slow, but again, your units are only really ever gonna get low because you made choices that weren't well thought out or didn't analyze everything as I never really had many times where I was messing up and felt the game was to blame because I could easily look at how I got myself into the situation and then realize what I could have done to avoid it in the first place. You can also speed up the process of carrying things back to your ship. If you have more than the required number of Pikmin carrying an item, they'll actually move way faster because of this. I learned this later on, but it took a while before it clicked. Personally though, I'm glad the game doesn't just stop me every 10 minutes to info dump stuff. It's always better when a game can show and have the player pick up on how the mechanics work versus filling the screen with constant text reminders. It also helps that when the game does stop you to text dump info, it's useful stuff that is worth explaining in this manner, and the way the devs worded these feels more natural to the story as the text is written to be as if Olimar is speaking to himself. I never felt the game was doing this because it felt I was a baby who needed assistance, it was doing it to help me get more into the mindset of Olimar and his predicament. I cannot tell you how many games I play that either text dump how the game works every second or don't do it enough so players end up not understanding how this mechanic works and usually tend to not use it. The Summons in Cage 2 being the best slash worst example of a game not explaining enough, I've seen so many players just disregard summons as the game never took the time to really explain why these are a valuable part of your toolset besides one very fast and easily skippable text screen. So it's nice to play a game that can really balance both of these. After spending a couple of days trying to get the parts we need and not die, we now arrive at the forest navel. As this area seems to be underground with light peeking from above only lighting the area around us, we notice by exploring there seems to be a lot more water, with even a ship part being in the middle of one of the ponds. This place seems to be a lot more vertical with paths having inclines and sticks used to help Pikmin travel up faster. Because of this verticalness, it can really show how annoying the AI for our Pikmin can be at times. They will get stuck a lot on the lower pass, or just outright walk off ledges when called. All of this combined makes this area a little more tricky to traverse. Since the path is no longer as straightforward like in previous stages, this means many times we will have to throw Pikmin to higher ledges and make our way over to them, as the water will hinder a lot of our options for pass. If you didn't learn from the water in the previous stages, yellow and red Pikmin can't swim and will start to drown in a really horrific way if they even so much as poke the water. We do some exploring and we finally run into a blue onion and we unlock the blue Pikmin. These guys are able to breathe underwater and can even be used to save Pikmin that are drowning as throwing them to assist any drowning Pikmin will let the blue ones throw them to safety. But while these guys are good for the water sections, I can't say they will be too useful for the enemies that lurk here, as you will prominently run into these bad boys, the Fiery Blowhog. Don't let their bandaged up look fool you, as these guys are quite capable of delivering heat. The name isn't just for show, as they will spit out fire burning whatever is in their path. Thankfully, you may be asking what the best way to deal with these guys are, well, it's the Red Pikmin. I didn't mention this before, but the Red Pikmin also have elemental resistance as fire will do nothing to them. Meaning these fiery blowhogs might as well be fired from their role as an enemy. P please laugh. I've been working on this video for so long. Please laugh. But you already know I didn't take much of that into account and still managed to have a lot of my Pikmin burn. 
now that we have three pikmin types i want to talk about how much i love the fact that the game will never tell you which one you should prioritize more as that all comes from the player figuring that out based on the environment you're in which was something i didn't like about hey pikmin as you never had to think which pikmin were more important in this area because the game did that for you while it did mean less times of me being screwed with progression because of me not having enough of a certain type it however just enforces more gaming with my brain turned off it's nice to get to a new area and see enemies that breathe fire or just a lot of water around it would have been so easy for the devs to stop you every time you enter a stage and just have a random text screen show up or have olimar go wow that's a lot of water better use the blue pikmin but just like the player experiencing this for the first time so was olimar meaning it's all down to what clues and info he and you can figure out then using said knowledge to come up with a game plan rewarding the player for observing and adapting it helps that each area really feels alive making it easy to compare stuff in the game to our own world which can help the player figure out what approach to take it's pretty cool to sometimes walk up on bulborb sleeping or seeing water enemies actually swimming around and doing aquatic stuff it makes it so much easier to immerse myself into the world while also realizing that this world isn't made for olimar or the pikmin as everything can and wants to eat or kill you while in most games you feel as if the world revolves around you and if you just choose to do nothing so does the world and pikmin that just isn't the case you see the world lived on and will continue to live on whether you make it off the planet or not Pikmin or you dying isn't going to bring this whole ecosystem to a halt as these creatures couldn't care about you at all. This feeling will really hit and drive the player to get the parts back since no one is going to come and save you and no creature on the planet would even think twice to not murk you. Which if Olimar was to ever die, the world would never even stop to take a second to even remember you. Now Olimar at the end of the day is the main character of the story but not the main character of the world. While the world is quite beautiful and you may be inclined to stop and get lost in the beauty of it, the world will keep on moving so you should as well. Now was that a deep section I just did or was that more of like a I'm 13 and this is deep moment? I don't know. Well, unlike most of the reviews I do, I usually go through a play-by-play -play of the stages, but I'll be honest, as much as I think each stage is great to play, there's not much to really say that would be too unique for each one, but I will still cover them because that's the point of the video. I just may not go into a lot of detail in every single stage. After leaving the navel and getting all three types, we start to head back to the older stages getting whatever is left, mostly the parts that were surrounded by water as now the blue Pikmin can have to go get it. Our first stop is the Force of Hope, as it has three parts we still need to find. I did have to reset the stage when I got here, as I didn't plan for the Pikmin to basically softlock me out of a part, as they couldn't build the bridge anymore, since their AI seemed to prioritize the ship part over actually making the bridge to bring the ship part back. This then taught me about a very easy to abuse exploit in Pikmin that I feel ruins any tension I talked about before. All the praise for how this game teaches the player to get better at thinking on the fly and adapting can easily get thrown out as you won't ever need it if you do this one simple trick. Anytime you go into a stage and let's say you do so poorly that no progress was made, you can just reset at any point and the game will pretend this day never happened. Meaning instead of making mistakes and learning from them which in return can make you better at the game, you can just keep resetting and make the same mistakes till you get lucky and it works. This heavily encourages the player to just rush around figuring out where everything is at in the area and then resetting, as now you wouldn't have to spend at least a day learning the layout, you already know it. While this isn't intended for the player to abuse it, it's so easy to do so that honestly I can't blame anyone for even considering it. Especially if your days are getting numbered, why would you not abuse this if you didn't have a good day? I however only ever used this if it was something out of my control like the Pikmin not building the bridge. This helped me learn the game better but again it's so easy to use this exploit. I can't say it was never not in the back of my mind to restart when a run went so poorly as it's basically a few button presses away with no drawbacks so again I don't blame anyone for using this. While exploring the forest of hope we come across this giant enemy here which can be considered as a boss. While there's not a lot of bosses in Pikmin 1 with some being optional, these fights can be pretty fun but I wouldn't say they teach the player or anything how to play better or really require too much thought. One of the bosses that you can fight only appears by getting to a later stage in the game before day 15 and it's such a tough fight that the best tip anyone can really give is to fight it at the start of the day so you can restart if the fight doesn't go well. 
Then you have some that only appear on even or odd days. Most of these will be required if you go for all ship parts, as they usually will be hoarding one nearby. The most thought that comes into these boss fights is just figuring out where the weak point is, and after that it's just throw Pikmin till they die. Like with this guy, the armored cannon beetle. The way you fight him is throwing Pikmin at him till one goes into his air hole and then attack his weak side under his wings. Which, I know it looks like it's on fire, but it's not. But I did think it was, so I brought a bunch of red Pikmin. But again, it looks hot. It's actually not. The other boss here is the Burrowing Snagrits, but I really didn't even know these were considered bosses, but yeah, they are. We even make our way back to the navel to get the last two parts here. This is when we run into BD Longlegs, which is probably my favorite boss in the whole game, just for the fact he's similar to the Daddy Longlegs Spider or Harvestman. I love just trying to dodge his feet as they slam down while aiming for his body, even if he's super easy. He's still my favorite. I, I, I love him too much to like hate him. The other boss here is the Mushroom Man Puffstool. This guy's pretty cool as he has a very unique attack of turning your Pikmin into a new Pikmin type that tries to kill you. These are Puffmen, which is technically the fourth Pikmin type in the game that isn't usable by the player. They will swarm Olimar and attack him like they do to everything else. Just stay back and let your Pikmin that are still alive do the work and Puffstool will go down without an issue. We also make another stop to the impact site as we still need the other ship part from here. This place is also the best area to farm Pikmin fast as there's tons of pellets everywhere. Plus this area has two optional bosses and they spawn depending on what day it is, if it's even or odd. If it's an odd day, Gulix will appear and he's a blue slime creature that will drown red or yellow Pikmin that you throw at him, while blue will defeat him without any issues. The Mamuta is the other boss that will appear on even days. He's actually harmless unless you provoke him. He's however beaten like all the other bosses. Finally getting the last part here, it's now time to tackle the hardest stage in the game. The one and only, the Distant Springs, is a massive area that has over 10 parts to find in some of the toughest groups of enemies you will face so far. Even having the beetle returning again that you fought in the Forest of Hope. Mix that with all the hazards that are around from fire pits, water, and a bunch of walls that block your path, it's safe to say you will be spending a lot of time here. You will really need to be on your A game when it comes to bringing parts back to the ship, as every part will feel like its own mini challenge forcing you to really plan out your optimal route if you want to still have enough time to beat the game. I'm gonna say this outright, while it makes sense to have the last area before the final boss be difficult, I think they went way overboard with the amount of stuff that can just ruin your day. For starters, almost all the parts are in very cramped spots with enemies surrounding the area, so more often than not, you will get dive bombed by multiple creatures as you try to deal with the one you need to fight. Then you could have the issue of trying to take the part back while crossing paths with upwards of 3-5 to five enemies almost at the same time. There's also so many walls that need to be destroyed or blown up with bomb rocks to the point it gets old fast. The water spots in this place are abundant, really making blue Pikmin be the most required unit to keep alive. This was actually the stage as well where I started to see the faults in the Wii motion controls as frantically trying to aim at multiple things while pressing A just caused a lot of misses. This was also the only level where my Pikmin constantly would just start to idle and forget we were in a fight or something. Like, like what the fuck are you doing? Do you, do you not see it? You're dying, come on man, you're dying. I had it happen multiple times back to back. It got to the point I started to be glad they were dying as they were pissing me off. To put in perspective how long this place took me, I got here on day 15. I finished this stage on day 26. This is a good idea in concept, taking everything you've learned with each Pikmin and using that to solve the mini challenges to get the parts back. It's just the amount of stopping to break walls or fight enemies that are powerful on their own and now make them into groups. It's just not fun. I really despise this place. I even talked to my friends about it who love Pikmin and I was told it took my friend to finally get the hang of this stage after he played Pikmin three times to completion. It's again too much for me, but I at least finished it with seconds to spare. So I guess that counts for something. After all that, dealing with all the monsters and all the deaths we had along the way, we got 29 parts out of 30, meaning just one more remains, and I have 4 days to do it. What's bad is the final part is fully required to beat the game, meaning if I fail, all my work is for nothing. The final trial is here and honestly, it's not that bad. I feel it does the same concept that the last area was trying to do by using all of your pigment to complete puzzles to advance. This place does it way better. This feels way more like an actual puzzle with three paths each having things that the Pikmin are known to do in them. 
Blue crosses the water to build bridges, red goes through the fire pass to help build things, and yellow, they just, uh, they're mostly used for throwing. They're mostly used for bomb rocks, which is probably why they could carry them in the first place over the red Pikmin, as it's the only thing they really ever do in the game. This area did stump me as I couldn't figure out how to get my red Pikmin across the pass since I couldn't just walk with them as a ledge blocked my ability to get up there. And you know also too, Olimar will burn to death if I did. Turns out the solution was super easy and it was just walk closer to the red Pikmin and call them and lead them to the box. Thank you to the chat member who said this because I would have never figured it out. I'm telling you right now, I would have just never known. We now stumble upon the final boss of the game, Emperor Bullblax, who is a boss I'm familiar with from Hey Pikmin. I'm gonna be real here, I don't think I fought him the way you're supposed to, as he kept killing my Pikmin every time I latched them onto him. I still managed to beat him over time even after a lot died, but man, I don't know what the intended method for fighting him was. It took me so long to beat him as well that I had to come back the next day for the part because I ran out of time. Also, this is just me, but the final boss music is pretty mad and I didn't like it. We come back and bring the final part to the ship as we now have completed Pikmin 1. And oh boy, I'm gonna be honest. I really love this game and I can see why people love this series, man. It really does reward the players who are efficient and can think fast while multitasking. This is also a perfect game for speedrunning and really made me even think about ways I can improve my run if I ever play this again. I probably won't because of Distant Springs, but if I did, you know, it, the options are there. We get a final shot of Olimar leaving as he says goodbye to the Pikmin, having a touching moment as we now accomplished our goal. We even get another shot of Pikmin taking down Bulborbs as they're now more confident and can finally stand up for themselves. Then we can see a bunch of colored onions flying away from the planet to then cut to Olimar as this time he makes it back home to have another day of adventures. And after everything we get to see how many Pikmin died and over 1000 died and only 174 survived all in a day's work. <laughs> so something I mentioned in my Hey Pikmin review that I didn't mention here. There was a song made for the game called I No Uta. This song did amazing numbers when it was released, but what I want to talk about is the meaning behind this song. When we showed up to this planet, the Pikmin were weak and feared everything, which caused them to be killed many times. Once Olimar appeared, it's strange to think how easily they just started to follow us and do whatever we commanded. Well, that's what the song is about. The song is about the perspective from the Pikmin themselves. No matter what, they will follow and do what we ask. Not because they're forced or they're slaves, but because they want to. As we will be the person to guide them to their freedom, a new hope for all of the Pikmin. And I can say, we sure did that. At least for 174 of them. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. I hope the video was worth the wait. Have a good one, guys.